Welcome everyone to the Vets History Workshop Seminar. Uh, my name is Dukelan Klapo. I'll be uh, chairing the session today. Um, we have uh, uh, Professor Jonathan, uh, who's a professor of sociology and African studies um, at Colgate University. Um, he's an extraordinary professor at the University of uh, Pretoria. Um, he's also worked in many years um, at Vets University, and he was um, part of the Vets History Workshop for, for many, many years. Um, he was um, also the deputy director of WISER. Um, he's published widely on, um, on the social and political history of Southern Africa, uh, on the British Empire history, and on uh, maritime history. So um, how we're going to do the session is that we're going to give the professor 20, 25 minutes, um, and then we'll um, take uh, comments and questions thereafter. Um, um, I think you're gonna use slides and um, I'll hand over to Professor Jonathan. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much to Tokelo and uh, Njogu for setting this up. And uh, hello to uh, my old friends who are out there. And thank you for, uh, thank you for attending. Um, so this paper starts with the figure of Doris Lessing. And if you're, um, I guess, of my age and you were a reader in the 1970s, uh, Doris Lessing might actually loom quite large in your mental world. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a young person, I read her uh, autobiographical novels about uh, Rhodesia and, and many of her other, other writings. Um, and in the novels, uh, there's the story of how she, in uh, Rhodesia, in the uh, early 1940s, um, becomes involved with a German exile um, uh, who she marries, and how they then attempt to set up a communist party in Rhodesia. Um, and Doris uh, um, tells about this both in the novels and then later in her, her autobiography. Uh, now, the person she married was uh, a man called Gottfried Lessing. Gottfried Lessing uh, had, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you more about him as we, uh, we go along, um, had ended up fleeing from the Nazis uh, to, to Zimbabwe. Uh, and uh, they, their marriage does not last long, they're politically active there, then uh, eventually Doris leaves for uh, England, uh, where she establishes herself as a writer. Uh, she initially uh, is in the British Communist Party, but then becomes a political dissident, uh, breaks away from the party in a group which uh, is led by E.P. Thompson, the historian, uh, and uh, continues to be politically active in anti-colonial causes, but then by the early to mid-1960s is becoming not, not only very hostile to communism as such, but actually in some ways very skeptical to political ap activism. Uh, on the other hand, Gottfried uh, goes to uh, the new East German communist state, and there rises up the hierarchy and becomes a very important person in East German African policy during the Cold War, which is significant because this, actually in terms of population, relatively small East German state, becomes quite a big player in the Cold War uh, in, in Africa, um, building links with nationalist movements and insurgent groups. Uh, now, the paper really uses uh, this, this biographical story to address certain large themes. And this is really the complex relationship 
between ideologies of anti-fascism, communism, and anti-colonial uh, nationalism. Um, anti-fascism is something which has attracted quite a lot of historiographical uh, attention recently. Um, the term was obviously used uh, by Stalinist communists for all kinds of instrumental reasons, but of course anti-fascism is something much wider than that. But for communists, it was also a vehicle through which they could appeal to a wider audience. Uh, on the other hand, you have the complex relationship between communism and anti-colonial nationalism uh, that communism um, linked up with anti-colonial nationalism uh, and in a way also made it into a vehicle for uh, attracting uh, broader, broader support, but with, with many, many tensions. So um, particular preoccupation in the paper is what's the relationship between the communist movement and uh, this, the, the, these nationalist movements in Africa. In a sense, who was using who in this relationship? Uh, and the paper, in a way, is, is an exercise in biography, or in a very small way, group biography, asking the question of how far are uh, looking at individual lives uh, useful exercises in uh, looking at these broader uh, social and, and political questions. Um, and the two sources which I found particularly uh, useful and interesting in doing this. In the German archives, the, um, the SED, the uh, ruling party in East Germany, uh, had a practice which they learned from the Soviet Union, which is that you get party members to write down short autobiographies at recent intervals. And this is actually a way of checking up on them. Now, there are all sorts of problems with this, which are kind of obvious as a source, but they're fascinating because you've got thousands of people churning out these micro um, autobiographies all the time. And I managed to find the ones for, uh, for Gottfried Lessing, um, which, which are an incredible source. The other thing is that uh, Gottfried Lessing marries um, uh, a woman called Ilsa, originally Ilsa Pogula, um, and she uh, is, has been a political exile in South Africa, uh, then uh, spends time in England um, before returning to, uh, to Germany. Uh, but during her time in England, she comes under suspicion by MI5, and this is a way in which the Cold War is sort of generative of an enormous body of material, which is fascinating from a historical point of view, uh, because uh, MI5 pretty, collect pretty much all the information that is to be had about her. Incidentally, if you ever get to, uh, to London, fascinating for the Cold War is a series called the KV2 Files, uh, which are basically the collections by... Uh, MI5 on various uh, spies and, and, and agents of, of rival powers and also on the British left to a considerable extent. Uh, but what's sort of unusual about this particular story is that you can bounce these uh, archival sources off work by a writer of true genius, uh, Doris Lessing, um, his autobiographical novels about her, her life in Southern Rhodesia, as it then was, uh, but I think even more, more fabulous, her uh, relevant volume of her autobiography, which I, I think is one of just the great Southern African biographies, uh, which tells you a lot about this period. So what I'm trying to do is to use these materials to work through a set of questions. And what, what, what does this, this add up to? Well, I think one thing is that um, it tells you uh, this, this approach tells you a lot about how the personal formation of the sort of leading activists of the East German state in the 50s and 60s were completely about their formation really in the, um, in, in the Nazi era, uh, in, in the way in which they reacted uh, to that. And there are two things which are particularly important. Uh, the one is the really crucial role which, East, which German communists played in 
uh, articulating the communist movement with anti-colonial nationalism. A uh, key figure here is a man called Willy Munzenberg, who runs this huge league against imperialism in the late 20s and 30s out of, uh, out of, out of Berlin. Um, a very, very important figure in world history. Maybe we'll come back to him in the, the, the discussion. Uh, and Munzenberg is doing all sorts of stuff to make, make these links. Now, what's complicated is that Munzenberg later um, turns against Stalin and is probably assassinated in 1940 uh, by one of Stalin's agents. So this history also becomes a bit hidden, but it was important in the formation of, of, of German communism. So it's significant to why the German communists see themselves as having this particular international significance. The, the other thing that happens is that the German communists play a big role in the Spanish Civil War. They um, have the largest contingent in the international brigades, and they play a crucial role in the fight for Madrid. Surprising number of East German um, communist leaders of the 50s um, were actually people who'd been in the international brigades. So uh, that creates, I think, this particular emphasis on internationalism. Um, Second thing which I, I, I think one can get out of this is that, you know, if you think about the, the um, East Germans and other people from East European, um, quote, socialist states who were involved in solidarity with African nationalists, and you think about the African nationalist leadership at this time, you're dealing with relatively small groups of people. So the links between these groups um, are really something you can usefully get into, I think, at a sort of individualized uh, level. Uh, third thing which emerges is you get a sense of the agency of these um, political figures and the uh, way in which fragmentations and divisions and cleavages um, operate uh, both between the Soviet Union and its allies and within the camp of those, 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 um, of those different allies. Um, the, the last general thing I want to, want to say something about is, is about the Cold War, because I think the Cold War is, in a sense, a difficult topic for historians of Africa, because in a way, the whole project of African history, as it really emerged as a discipline in the, in the 60s and 70s was to restore sense of African agency, that Africans weren't just the subjects to operations of colonial regimes. But on the other hand, we also have the, the, the fact that uh, in the Cold War, the great powers and their allies really were powerful, that they assembled all sorts of resources which they directed at Africa. So in a sense, you have to kind of find a balance between recognizing African agency and also recognizing that uh, these external powers did shape the situation. And the, the, well, it's a little bit old now, but the book, which I think really gets this in a, in a fabulous way, is Odd Arno Westout's uh, The uh, Global Cold War, which, which I think gets that. OK, so very briefly, um, because I hope you've had a look at the paper. Um, what's the story I'm telling here? Um, Gottfried Lessing is the skin of an um, interesting family, uh, very important uh, industrializers of Russia, but actually German nationals, so with a foot in both Russia and, uh, and, and, and Germany. Um, very, very wealthy um, um, group of people. And they, um, at, uh, he's born in 1914, just after the First World Wars, War breaks out. Because they're German nationals, they're interned by the Russians. Uh, they then, uh, after the war, return to Berlin, and they live in the leafy western suburbs of Berlin, near the Schlachtensee. Um, uh, uh, and what's the context? The context is, of course, the turbulence of Weimar. Um, and Berlin is famously a bastion of the Communist Party. Red Berlin, as they um, used to say at the 
the, the, the time. Uh, and there's a school students uh, organization led by the communists and Gottfried claimed, and it's impossible to check, but he claimed that he had been a, a member as a young boy before the, the Nazis came to power. Um, he then goes to university um, and because he has one Jewish grand, one Jewish grandparent, the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, founding patriarch of the, the House of Lessing was, uh, um, was Jewish, um, he had one Jewish grandparent, which under the sort of bizarre Nazi rules meant he could go to university, uh, but he couldn't do what he wanted to do, which is to, to uh, qualify as a lawyer. So after studying uh, in Berlin, he uh, goes to London and then through a complicated uh, set of events, ends up in Rhodesia. His sister, um, uh, Irena uh, Gysi, uh, sorry, Irena Lessing, marries a, um, another German communist called Klaus Gysi. Uh, they stay um, in Germany and incredibly they operate an underground communist network out of this villa in, in um, Berlin uh, under the Nazis and manage not, not to get caught. Klaus later becomes uh, an important official in uh, East Germany. Um, well, Rhodesia, as you'll know if you've read the Doris Lessing novels, um, had a large contingent of the Royal Air Force during the war who were there are there for training and that group in particular links up with some exiles and some white Rhodesians and they found uh, that they, they get involved in this attempt to set up a communist party uh, which in the end is a bit of a fiasco but they temporarily have some influence there are two things going on one is there's a move to the left in the um, white Rhodesian Labour Party uh, you know I, I, I sort of disagree with the idea that the 1940s was a kind of steady march in white politics to, to apartheid in fact there's this very strong reformist streak both in South Africa and Rhodesia and they try and work with that and then they also work with the veteran of the um, uh, ICU Charles Nzengeli who is the big um, guy in uh, African nationalist politics in the um, township of, 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 of Harare and um, uh, it's whether they have any long-term effect is is, 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 a, is a complicated question, which we can't really go, go into here. But they are very, very uh, active. And remember, this is also the period when the Soviet Union is very popular because of the resistance of the, of the Soviet Union to the Nazis. Um, then what happens is that um, Gottfried leaves uh, leaves Rhodesia, he goes to London, uh, and then eventually ends up uh, back in East Berlin and rises up through the party hierarchy, uh, eventually getting to quite a high position in the, uh, the, the economic apparatus. Um, in 1951, there's an international youth games event organized in East Berlin. And uh, in his work in the organization of that, uh, he then Gottfried meets uh, Ilza Bogula. Ilza Bogula had come to um, South Africa as a refugee. Uh, she had been a political activist, uh, gone to Austria, worked in the, as a sort of underground um, communist courier. Uh, really quite remarkable person this at, a, at, a, at a very young age. She, um, in Johannesburg, um, got onto the executive committee of the Communist Party and became really quite important activist, I think, in the early 1940s. In the um, Communist Party, she meets Yusuf Dadu, who, you know, if you're an aficionado of South African Commun Communist Party history, you'll know it becomes a very, uh, very significant figure. Um, Dandu uh, had uh, risen to prominence in the 40s, early 40s, with the resistance against uh, Smuts's uh, restrictions on the, uh, the Indian community. Um, and, uh, you know, 
very important, important activist of, of the time. Marriage does not, however, go well uh, in, the, uh, in, in the end. And um, Ilza goes to London, has some difficulty getting back to, to Germany, but eventually is, is uh, allowed to, to return. And I think it's worth noting that um, this is at the height of Stalinism. Uh, the construction of East German state is presided over by Walter Ulbricht, who, as you can see from the pictures, well connected. Um, and Ulbricht um, was extraordinary out and out Stalinist. I mean, he, he when the Germans were in exile in Moscow, he shopped out a lot of the comrades to the NKVD and. That's kind of how he rose, rose to the top. And of course, um, you know, very, very reluctant to de-Stalinize. He was actually much slower than many of the other East European leaders to, to, uh, to, to denounce Stalin after the Soviet line turned against him and, 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 and so on. So that's what, what they're going to. Um, Gottfried uh, has, uh, partly because Ulrich, Ulbricht was so, um, determined to control everything. He liked to shake the party up from time to time. Uh, and there's a there's a kind of purge of the leadership uh, in the mid 50s. And at that point, uh, Gottfried's upward career through the bureaucracy comes to a halt. However, um, he then sees another opportunity, He gets into the foreign service who initially sent him to Indonesia, where he does well. And then he's able to persuade the Foreign Service, I think, that because he has this African background, he kind of knows about Africa. It's a sort of communist Orientalism, if you like. Uh, I'm the expert on this, this region. Uh, what he uh, then, uh, th then does is to actually make a huge success of um, his work for the party bureaucracy um, and uh, concludes a number of important um, trade and other deals with uh, significant leaders of African states, including Kwame Nkrumah. Um, uh, so very, very uh, prominent uh, and they move to really the, the, uh, the um, sort of signifying his uh, his importance. Uh, they move to the heart of Berlin to this vast prestige uh, project uh, in the in, in the center of Berlin, um, which houses a lot of the official demand. I was going to say something about that, but I'll, I'll skip that. Um, he also connects with somebody who's very important in his life, a man called Lotta Henschel. And it's an interesting sociological contrast here, because Henschel is a working class boy from kind of deep rural Saxony, an artisan. But the East Germans had this very dramatic class based affirmative action where they um, they actually work to promote a lot of people inside the um, bureaucracy from working class backgrounds. So you get really a, a very dramatic sort of social revolution, if you like, within the, within the, the bureaucracy. And uh, I think that sort of social contrast between these two types and their very, very different backgrounds in uh, Gottfried and Lotta is, is interesting. And, and Lotta becomes this sort of, you know, Robin to, to his, uh, his Batman, if you like. Um, so uh, together, I, I know that uh, we are uh, we're running uh, running on time. So I will come. I'll, I'll uh, try and draw things to a close. Um, the the very important episode, though, which um, Godfrey plays a part in, is that um, the opportunity opens up to build diplomatic links with um, in Tang the newly independent Tanganyika. Um, which is very important to, um, e to, to East Germany because it's relatively diplomatically isolated. Uh, there's the this very brutal revolution in um, Zanzibar um, and the leader of Zanzibar, um, 
Sheikh Abed Karume is very friendly towards East Germany. Uh, and, and through that, um, East Germans are able to get, get this sort of uh, foothold in Tanzania. And Gottfried actually plays a direct part in the negotiations of the uh, unification of Zanzibar with Tanganyika into, into Tanzania. Um, and really, I think, is, is a huge success as a diplomat in this period. Uh, also, Ilza has, of course, links with the South African um, uh, and movements, ANC, Communist Party, from her uh, time in, in South Africa. And so she's able to play a role in facilitating links with the uh, South, South African uh, and other Southern African movements, which are based in Tanzania at the time. Um, then you have uh, in the 70s, um, Eric uh, Honecker takes over from Ulbricht and Southern Africa becomes really important to East German policy, uh, links to the liberation movements, uh, and that in a way gives, I think, a further fillip to uh, Gottfried's career, uh, in this East German activism throughout Southern Africa. Then in 1978, uh, Gottfried was appointed ambassador to Uganda. And I, I have to say that this is the sort of perhaps one of the most extraordinary examples of ruthless Cold War politics, because these Germans clearly knew that uh, Idi Amin was a mass murderer, that he was basically looting the uh, Ugandan economy blind. But nevertheless, they decide that because he is seen as an anti-Western figure, uh, they will uh, um, get together with him. And, and so Godfrey's actually in charge of relations with, with Amin. But then, of course, the war breaks out um, and uh, Gottfried um, uh, flees. Um, uh, sorry, I mentioned Ilsa died in, uh, in, the, in the early 70s and he remarried. Um, Gottfried uh, and, and Lothar uh, and their wives attempt to flee and they're caught up in, in the crossfire and, and, and killed. So the whole thing ends, and, and, ends tragically. Um, so I think the, the, the question which that really leaves me uh, with um, for, for today, I guess, is what's the legacy of this? In some ways, I think you can see the legacy of this history uh, in the discussions about what's going on in Ukraine, because, of course, one of the things that's really striking is the, um, the, the, the fact that globally opinion on this is polarized so much. Southern Africa, there's support to me, surprising amount of uh, sympathy for Russia, but not surprising when you sort of see the way that Russia's somehow, despite being an you know, outrageously capitalist state, has inherited the, man, the mantle of socialist state solidarity um, and, 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 and the legacy of that. But I think also in some ways, uh, there's a kind of blindness to the Stalinist history, which also informs the, that, that kind of, attitude which people in Southern Africa have. So that's what I have to say. So I'll stop there and sorry, I went on longer than I, I, uh, I intended. Um, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, for young men like myself, it, the, the was fascinating. Um, I was telling Jogo that I don't know any of these figures, but the way that you use their lives to sort of make bigger points, um, so I'll uh, sort of uh, at this moment uh, allow uh, questions and comments um, for anyone that has. Um, you could just um, raise your hand. Um, Ariana um, has her hand up and you can also use the chat, um, the chat uh, function and I can read the question uh, to Prof. Go ahead, Ariana. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, yes, hi. thanks. Thanks for the paper, John. Um, I thought the details about the, the personal and political co connections of uh, uh, Gottfried and Ilse Lessing were 
uh, very interesting and I learned a lot um, about their lives. Um, and, and I take your uh, point about um, the importance of a Cold War in shaping uh, liberation struggles and decolonization in, in the third world and, and vice versa. Um, but, but at the same time, I found that the Cold War framing of, of much of the paper was quite limiting. Um, Gottfried and Ilse appear at worst in the paper as um, um, Cold War warriors that are working, uh, you know, in, in the service of this really top-down controlling and, and paranoid state. Um, that's intent on uh, kind of establishing influence on African countries and African liberation movements. And so their job is to opportunistically trying to win them over to, to their side. Um, and at best they appear as these individuals uh, driven by um, uh, some, some kind of personal ambition or, or careerism. Um, that at times kind of um, uh, uh, so, so, so at times they are able to assert this this individual agency against uh, this really uh, controlling and top down uh, bureaucracy and and party. Um, but there's there's not much in the paper. You speak about the prehistory of inter of German internationalism, but. In the paper, you don't really say much about um, communist internationalist politics in this period. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about how Ilse and Gottfried may have understood internationalism and how, as uh, in actors in this history, they, they may have helped shape it. Um, thanks a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting you read it like that because, I mean, in some ways, I think I'm not, um, perhaps I was not intending to, for it to come across quite as hostile as that because, I mean, I obviously do realise that uh, they were um, yeah, really motivated. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to say is that they were really motivated by uh, what had happened in the 1930s and their experiences in the 1930s and that you know their their anti-fascism in, in a sense was was very genuine and then that that leads them to these experiences in southern africa where they do actually have uh you know i think a real identification with african nationalism and seeing it as a just cause and so on so maybe i i, I need to um, change the way that i um, express that but I mean in some ways yeah at the same time I do think that um, you know there was if you like a sort of um, East German state interest if you like dimension to the way the East German state thought I mean it's, one of the things that's striking to me is that in a sense there's still a sort of almost an attitude that like Germany is a great power and you need to take us seriously. So um, to a to, to, to greater extent than um, I thought there, there, there would be. Um, but yes, you know, internationalism is, um, is, is complex. Um, I mean, it's, I've, I've looked at some of the documents in um, East German archive about these very young uh, East Germans who sent in quite large numbers to Angola during the war uh, to support um, the, the MPLA. And, uh, you know, uh, undergo a lot of self-sacrifice. And but, but you can sort of see there it's actually very much a mixed bag because there are people who are really motivated and, 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 and dedicated. And there are then people who are actually there in some ways for a good time. It's complicated. It's, you know, there, there are lots of different things going on. Um, so I, I do think there's, uh, you know, there is, there is a way in which the East German state does carry forward that internationalism uh, from, uh, from the 30s. And that's one of the things I was, was trying to say. 
um, it's, it's very difficult to get a balance here, you know. I mean, I think the vision that people have of East Germany is often, you know, what they see in, um, you know, the lives of others. That's kind of, you know, probably the most influential representation of, of East Germany. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't, uh, yes, it wasn't just the Stasi and bureaucracy, um, but, you know, there was also a very strong coercive and bureaucratic dimension to it. So, you know, I'm trying to capture some of these things and it's, it's hard to pull together. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, thanks for Ariana. Um, and thanks for, Prof, for your response. Um, I see one more hand, uh, Gabriela um, and Rob, uh, please um, go in that order and then we'll, we'll see if we have more questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, maybe adding on to Ariana's um, comments, but also what uh, Peter put into the chat uh, about the call for being limiting. I, I must say in, in, in favor of Jonathan's um, presentation that the Cold War has indeed very much shaped our, our lives and, and political um, divisions and unities. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and also not forgetting, I mean, the 60s were still very much a platform for the former different um, exile factions um, with the Moscow um, returnees, um, of course, getting the upper hand eventually. And, and, and so, so I think these are interesting and but also very um, important dynamics which did remain with us um, throughout into the into the 80s. Um, and so I, I think I must uh, I quite agree with Jonathan on many of his, of his points here. Yeah. Thanks. I, I originally from East Germany, by the way, I was <laughs> born and bred. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Rob, you want to go ahead? And then uh, Prof can sort of answer both of them. Sure. sure. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, Jonathan, thanks very much for a, a fascinating, fascinating paper. I think I, I think I'd like to kind of pick up a little bit on this, this question of the Cold War as well, but but taking the discussion perhaps in a sl slightly different way, which is to say that one of the issues of the I think of the Cold War is that it becomes a, a horribly monolithic term. Um, and I think in many respects, um, it can sometimes obs obscure really significant shifts and historical changes and so I kind of I, I fear this is a slightly unfair question but I, but I wonder if you'd be happy to kind of project forward a little bit because because Godfrey dies at a really kind of intriguing moment in 1979 so that and in many ways we see very shortly after his death mm -hmm. some significant shifts both in terms of the trajectory of liberation struggles within southern Africa but also in the eastern bloc um, and also ideologically and politically within the West as well. So there's there's some fascinating kind of it's a fascinating geopolitical moment at which your kind of major actor dies. So could you could you kind of give us a sense of of your interpretation of what follows in in a way? What, yeah. Where where do we where do we take um, East German so DDR solidarity with uh, with with Southern Africa in the 1980s? Yeah, well, the, you know, the, the lens which I've got into this, as I say, I've looked at some of the uh, material on the East German volunteers in Angola, which is, you know, really extraordinary stuff. I mean, they, they are kind of taking these basically kids, you know, young 20s from um, small industrial towns in East Germany and kind of dumping them in like Swapo bases in Angola in the middle of the, um, the, 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 the Angolan war and um, to, to, to kind of do, do good works. So, you know, there's a very intense level of, uh, of, of engagement by, um, by East Germany. Um, they're really um, extremely involved. And I think my, my, my sense from that material is that there's a lot of optimism at the beginning of the 80s about actually how well things are going in that project. And, you know, there's this, um, there's this famous book on the, the Soviet Union called, uh, which has got the title like something like everything was forever until it was no more. And there's a bit of an element of that, I think, to East Germany that everything seems to be ticking over 
pretty well until about uh, 1988, when suddenly everything kind of starts falling in a heap. Um, and you even get actually the extraordinary in, in Angola, uh, there's this like micro vendor in the sort of Germ the small East German community where they're having terrible fights and kind of party meetings about what's going to happen next and, 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 and so on. But for a long time, it looks like that this project is, is really succeeding and suddenly, bam, it's over. Um, one thing I might just mention as well about that, uh, which I see somebody put up in the, the, the comments, and if you've not had a chance to read the paper, I, I mentioned it, that um, the, uh, that the nephew of Gottfried is this guy, um, Gregor Gysi, who actually uh, is a sort of interesting semi-dissident but influential figure in the SED and becomes actually the last chair of the ruling party uh, and then goes on to become a very prominent left-wing politician in contemporary Germany and, and until quite recently was actually the leader of the uh, of Die Linke, the, uh, uh, the, the leftist party in, in Germany and is, is actually a very fascinating and brilliant individual, fantastic rhetorician and 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 actually person of very wide culture so you know sort of echoes of, of godfrey there um but i think yeah so 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 what i would say is this project is of east germany and africa is remarkably successful really goes um, goes along um and you know appears to be getting significant leverage and then it all kind of suddenly falls uh, falls apart yeah um all right uh cool um we have um um, uh, um comments mostly comments on the on the chat uh, section i think maybe i'll read one or two after i've yeah, taken uh, yeah after i've taken linda um there's still a bit of time to take more um comments or questions um, so I'll take Linda for now. Um, go ahead, Linda. Okay, thanks, John. That was a wonderful paper. I greatly enjoyed reading it. I, I'm just interested in um, the networks with intellectuals in his period in Tanzania and Uganda, and whether there's any archival evidence of that. I can remember somebody once talking about... Uh, the relationship between embassy officials and the local intellectual groups at the time. And I, I don't know if you read any reports that he wrote of, at the time, whether there were any, or if you could just say a bit more about the archives when he was there. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the, so the, the archives I managed to get are the sort of internal party discussions. And uh, th this would have been exactly the thing I would have been looking, kind of thing I would, would have been looking for, but I didn't actually get a lot of that detail, which might be due to the kind of particular focus they have. But of course, that would be a fascinating question because the university uh, was a big center of um, leftist thought. Walter Rodney was there. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, even some people we uh, we know, Dan O'Mara was there. Um, so you know, a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting stuff uh, going on. Uh, so I imagine that they did have connections, but I did not actually find uh, evidence uh, of, of 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 that. You know, might just, pr probably just the particular sources I came across. Cool, um, Roshan, please go ahead. Thank you. It's a very interesting paper. Thank you, Jonathan, um, for writing it um, and obviously doing a lot of research into um, what's part of my own family. <laughs> so it was particularly interesting. But I just, picking up from what uh, the sort of theme that Ariana started around the, inter the question of genuine internationalism, I think, you know, using terms like communist orientalism to me sounds like left-wing anti-Semitism, which I think is not a 
a term that means much, but does play into a certain view of the world that was part of co coming out of the Cold War, but that has particular relevance also to your comments right at the end about Ukraine. Um, you know, to me, either you're looking at the, looking at it as the Eastern Bloc were Orientalist in their approach towards um, Africa in particular in this case, or the third world as it was called, or you're not, you're looking at whether or not there was a genuine internationalism. And I think also the use of the word Stalinism, you know, yes, we all use it in a slightly jokey way um, on the left <laughs> to mean something, but it's actually, in fact, is a dog whistle. And in the current climate, I think using those words has a, plays back onto the Cold War meaning or Cold War um, idea, even when it's not relevant, because we all know that Putin has himself rejected everything to do from Lenin till the last communist uh, leader in the Soviet Union. There's no kind of connection in his eyes between himself now and then, but yet in the West that trope is used, particularly now when they're ramping up um, a lot of uh, hysteria as well around a very tragic and terrible situation in Ukraine. So I just wanted to ask you if you had thought about those, you know, those particular ways of, of phrasing things and the kind of meaning it has both then but also now in creating a kind of a, a sort of an idea of the lens from which you're coming from, which may or may not be where you are coming from, but I just wanted wondered if you'd had thought of that in the, in the way you'd use those words yeah. well look maybe i was being a bit uh flip in uh you know saying communist or orientalism but it is um uh you know it is the case that in a sense when the um the, the soviet union and uh the um other um, Soviet bloc states uh, got involved with Africa policy, which in some ways they didn't really do in a lot of detail until the Congo crisis. I mean, that's really, I think, the big turning point in the sort of intervention in, in Southern Africa. Um, you know, there wasn't all that much expertise, academic expertise, expert uh, yeah, expertise. So um, they did uh, sort of have to assemble a kind of intellect, a, a package of uh, individuals who um, were knowledgeable about the region, and, and they didn't have a lot to work with. I mean, you know, Gottfried was super intelligent person and and extremely erudite. Obviously, had studied social issues in Zimbabwe a lot while he was there but you know he wasn't a, a career Africa expert and there is a way in which he suddenly emerges as in the bureaucracy as the person who knows what to do about Africa so you know that's what I'm trying to get at that you know who gets to be an expert on Africa uh, there is a sort of creation of um, expertise and the, there's I'm trying to remember Anybody help me here? The the great Soviet expert on um, on on Africa in 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 uh, in this period, um, Pomerenko. I can't remember. Anyway, the great Soviet expert on on Africa was literally a guy who was an expert on Central Asia and was then told to become an expert on Africa. Right. So there is an element of kind of how do we organize knowledge about this region in which we're trying to operate when we don't have necessarily a lot to to to, to go on um stalinism i mean look yeah i mean i i, I see somebody's registered the point that you know i, I mentioned the mario frank biography of uh ulbricht that yeah you know that, that, that there are ambiguities and i mean certainly there was you know ulbricht was certainly a very kind of german figure in some ways he has some um you know particular um, kind of cultural takes on things and so on but 
I mean, in my mind, there's no question that Ulbricht was a Stalinist. I mean, he literally sent large numbers of people off to be shot by the NKVD. So Ulbricht was a Stalinist. In that sense, I mean, obviously, it's much more complicated. They're bringing together all these social forces um, and so on. Um, in, in the East German state, there's a lot of complexity to it. Uh, but I don't think you can get away from the term Stalinist. I think it was a, a real thing. Yeah. Um, okay, we have, um, I've decided not to read the question, uh, the comment, because most of them are co comments. And I think that uh, Professor uh, Jonathan has uh, you know, sort of tasked on most of them. Um, we have a couple of minutes for um, one or two more comments or questions. Um, if not, um, I guess uh, I could give this opportunity to Prof. Jonathan to sort of um, give his concluding remarks on, on his paper. Um, yeah, and then thank everyone for participating um, in the Vets History Workshop. Yeah. Well, if I can just go on a bit of a um, uh, diversion here. Uh, one thing I did mention, which I'd like to um, direct uh, people's uh, attention to, is what I mentioned about Willy Munzenberg and the League Against Imperialism uh, in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, that is a really important uh, movement which draws together a lot of people who later become most important leaders of nationalist movements in Africa and Asia and even Latin America and actually some people who um, become leaders of post-colonial states including uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Um, fantastically important uh, movement which has a lot of um, uh, resonance and, and I think that's something that I encourage people to kind of draw into their framework if you're interested in that period. Um, one thing that's fascinating about that is that one of the people who was at the fir famous first conference of League Against Imperialism was uh, J.T. Gumedi of the, the ANC, later goes after the Brussels meeting in 1927, goes to Berlin, J.T. Gumedi of ANC arrives at the station in Berlin. He is met by a thousand German red guards cheering him on. He later goes to Moscow and meets Stalin. There's an interesting uh, biography about, of, of him by, by, by Deal. Uh, so th there are all sorts of unexplored, interesting connections through the communist movement and through particularly this history of German communism, which I, which I think are just out there waiting to be explored by somebody. Um, I won't, won't try and pull things together. I do realize maybe one thing I will say is, look, uh, I do realize as, as, as the responses have suggested, you know, this history is very, is, is very live and we're gonna have different takes on it. I'm not trying to, um, uh, make super polemical points, but I do think it's uh, it, 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 it's it's important um, that we try to you know trace these these complex lineages of of, of current ideas. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and on that note, um, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for making time and um, sharing your paper with us. Um, thank you to all the participants. Um, this uh, seminar will be available uh, on YouTube, on the Fed's History Workshop YouTube channel. Um, thank you, everyone. And please look out for other um, upcoming seminars on, on our website. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Cheers. for having me. Much appreciated. Okay.